Welcome everyone to the 27th degree with Chris and Nancy from 27 Degrees Consulting. We're really excited today to have Dr. Jim Herman Gildo with us today. We're going to talk a little bit about general surgery and also about robotic surgery. Before we get going, though, I just want to recognize our sponsor, Bay Coast Bank. Bay Coast Bank is right for all of your financial needs. Visit baycoastbank.com or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. So thanks for joining us today. This is really great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. I've known Dr. Herman Gildo for many, many years. We've shared a lot of patients together. I was really excited to have him on the show. He's a great surgeon. And we're going to talk a lot about robotic surgery. But um, first, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. I think the audience would like to hear that. I'm local. I was uh, born in New Bedford, lived in Dartmouth most of my life. Um, I stayed local, went to college in New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire, then Dartmouth Medical School, and then did my residency locally at UMass in Worcester. And then I came down to Fall River in 2002 to start my practice. When did you finish at UMass, your residency? 2002. 2002, okay. All right, so you I was at UMass too, but I was a little bit before you, so. Yeah. Not much before, yeah. but just Yeah, before. I finished in 97, yeah. so yeah, you have two years different, so. Yeah, very good, excellent. So, um, so talk to us a little bit about just general surgery. Yeah, like, what kind great. of surgeries do you do? Like, yeah, what's what does like... a general surgeon do? Tell our audience. So, the biggest reason I actually picked general surgery as a career path is just the amount of surgery that we can do and the different surgeries we can do. So, basically, general surgery is pretty much most things in the abdomen. You can work on the liver, you can work on the pancreas, the stomach, the spleen, small bowel, large bowel, colon cancers. Oh uh, hernias, and you can extend that to breast, breast cancer, and of course, um, like lipomas and cysts of the skin. So you can do all of it, you can narrow it down, so it just gave a lot of options to keep everything interesting for a long career. Great. So when you're actually, like, when you know you want to go on that career path and you actually cut someone open for the first time and like get in there is it what you expect or is it is it like hard because it's so like obviously detailed and some things are so tiny well it starts off you start off with gross anatomy in medical school and then in residency so by the time you get to your own practice making an incision in a live person isn't traumatic anymore yeah um it's it's it gets to a point where um it you know that there's a live person that you're responsible for their life, but it, the surgery itself is routine and should be routine in every case. For the most part, do you ever get surprised when you open someone up? Like, you know, if you're doing um, gallbladder, do you do gallbladder yes. surgeries too? If you're doing like gallbladders, like what surprises you when you open someone up? So what we do is when I go into an operation, I have plan A. This yep. is what's going to happen. But you're going to have plan B, C, and D. Okay. And one of those plans could even be to abort the operation altogether because you can't do it. Convert to open if you have to. You find something else you have to deal with. Right. And you've got to be prepared in any surgery to deviate from what your plan was. Yeah. How long... Which is interesting because yeah. now you get judgment involved, you can get creative. This is the operation I need to complete. How do I do it now? Mm. Oh, yeah. So when you're actually in working with someone, what was your, like, residency? Like, you had to train under a general mm. surgeon, I would imagine, right? Yeah. So at UMass, uh, basically, you're there for five years. Okay. And every year they give you different types of cases to operate on. So in the early years, you start off with... Uh, maybe breast cases and some hernias, and by the time you are in your fourth and fifth year, you're doing liver surgery, pancreas surgery, gallbladders, uh, cancer surgery. So they don't throw you into the right. fire on of day course. one. They get you to the point that by the time you graduate, you are independent, safe, and ready to tackle most things mm -hmm. without a surgeon across from you. When did you know you wanted to go into surgery in medical school? How, how, how early on? Because I remember that point when I yeah. decided to go into internal medicine, and there's, there's always that big differentiation. You're going into surgery or you're going into medicine? And I think I decided actually pretty early on, but I'm curious when you decided. I was really on, early on. I decided I wanted to be a surgeon in seventh grade. 
Really? Are you yeah. serious? So back then, even in elementary school, I was making Play-Doh models of the heart. <laughs> you weren't like cutting blue up your cats red. or anything. No, there was you? no live animals okay, involved. Okay, that's good because that would be. But scary. I was making uh, <laughs> like Play-Doh podcast. models <laughs> of organs. <laughs> right. Even in like elementary oh school and gosh. junior high. Wow. So, so you were. No, really... I didn't know I was going to go into was a general surgery yeah. in seventh grade, obviously. But I knew that I wanted to do something in medical school and uh and surgery in general that's that's great that's but just start early yeah because <laughs> yeah, when you're in you know you're in, in medical school you have to pick your residency so uh, you have like to, what year so you, so you know you're you it's third it's third third you really have to oh. know by third year what direction you're going in because then you're doing certain electives and they should be oriented towards what you're going to ultimately do and then fourth year you're you know deciding what residencies you want to go to and then they have something called the match where you are you put a list of your favorites you know one through let's say 10 and then you get picked to go to a particular place and then you, it's a contract you go to that place mm. huh. so you know if you put down uh, mass general first and they don't pick you in you know let's say some place in i'll just use georgia for example is number seven on your list and they're the one that pick you that's where you go that's where you go yeah. Would it be easy for you, like, say you love California and you want to go out to California, would it be easy for you to transfer everything out there? And I'm not talking licenses, but I'm talking, I, do they have, do different states or different regions have different ways of doing certain surgeries? You mean now as an attending? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can go. Yeah. There are job opportunities for every physician in every state in this country. I'm not even talking job opportunities, though. I'm, I'm you're like, talking about differences in, in, uh, in the actual procedures the and stuff. Is like, is all, one region even, of the nation yeah, like so unified? cutting edge that it's like, oh, my God. There are pockets. There are variations throughout the country. Yeah. Some, some, um, some areas are more cutting edge in other areas yeah there's still a lot of open surgery being done in this country even though laparoscopy started in the 90s right people are still doing open hernias uh robotics started in the early 2000s mm. basically and there are hospitals that still do not have a robot mm -hmm. why they're expensive they're expensive uh, they need the surgeon that's be there to actually have the skill set to use yeah. the robot. You have to go through the training. There's a learning curve. Right. Um, so when we talk about robots, help someone visualize like the the robot. So it's kind of like Lost in Space, you know. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> Some people aren't that old. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's really like that, huh? So <laughs> it is. It's like that. so. Basically, the robot is made of three parts. You have the tower that has all of the software and where everything plugs into. Yep. And then you have the console where I sit, which could be three feet, four feet, five feet away from the patient. And then you have the robot itself, which has four arms. Oh. And you drape those four arms, and those four arms are now sterile. So th when we as in laparoscopic surgery, you put in the ports into the abdomen, whether it be three ports, four ports, five ports. So when you say ports, the trocars that we put the instruments through. So you're actually to puncturing operate. the yes. small, yeah, small little holes. Small little holes. Um, and then the robot attaches to those arms. Oh. The arms of the robot attaches to those ports. Okay. okay. And then I go to the console, and then the tech at the bedside. His or her job is to just, when I need certain instruments, they slide it onto the robot, into the port, and now I can use it. From my side of the, of the, uh, of the console side, it's 3D visualization, which is important because when you do laparoscopic surgery, it's a 2D screen, you're working in a 3D body. Right. When I'm at my console, I have a 3D body and a 3D visualization. Hmm. So it's a, that right there is... So is it like a virtual that's headset amazing kind of? Advantage it's right not, there. like, your whole head is not in there, but your eyes are on. So it's nothing strapped to your head. It's just yeah. that you're in all the way to probably your ears. Oh, wow. Uh, so you can stick your head out. The important thing about the robot is the robot only moves when you move it. If you take your head out, it freezes in the spot that you just so left that, it. So that's a great safety precaution, yeah, of course. So nothing slides, nothing's yeah. moving. Yeah. Um, when you grab, if you are grabbing something and you take your head out, it stays grabbed. Oh, nice. So it, it just freezes. Uh, it just freezes. Everything freezes. We. I don't know if anyone 
it, I don't know if our audience will be able to see this, but this is basically, I'll, I'll hold it up to the Ooh. camera. This is the Da Vinci robot that is being used, that Dr. Herman Gildo uses. And um, you can get a sense, if you can see that, um, how it, the operator has their head inside the machine, basically um, looking at the view of the of the, the Taylor patient. can post that too on our Yeah, we can, we can post this. It, it's really... It, I mean, I think a lot of people haven't seen that, so it's really a fascinating thing. I think it'd be interesting to pose. So when you're working with this, like if you're just doing a, a surgery with your, your real hands and not mm. like the little robot hands, what is, I mean, it must offer an, a real advantage. Yeah, let's, well, let's talk about the advantages because I bet a lot of our viewers don't really understand why it's, it's useful. Compared so, to just regular, just doing the operation yourself. So there's different types of surgery that are still done today. There's the good old-fashioned open surgery, which we still need to do at times. Uh, someone makes a big incision, um, two, three, four hands can fit in it, and the surgery is completed. The down, the problem with the open surgery is post-op problems. Right. So now, whenever you make an incision, bigger incision, you have a chance of infection. You have a chance of hernias from that incision. Because you have now violated the abdomen with an open incision, the air, oxygen, is touching the internal organs and now adhesions form and then you can have problems with bowel obstructions after. Oh. Okay, and then of course we have the pain. Yeah. Big incision, a lot of pain after. So that's open surgery. And then in the 90s, they started doing laparoscopic surgery. Um, so now, for obviously many, uh, for decades, we've done laparoscopic right. surgery. The same ports that you basically use for robotic surgery, they're different ports, but basically ports. The problem with laparoscopic surgery is you have these two straight sticks, and all these sticks do is they go in and out, up and down, and you were limited laparoscopically to the cases that you can do because you had to get to the spot. And I've done thousands of laparoscopic cases, and you have to contort your body to get to places just because of patient's body habitus, uh, are there adhesions in the way or scar tissue in the abdomen? What do I have to get around? Um, is the camera in the right location right. to do the operation? So it's uncomfortable as an operator. To and do it's that uncomfortable. Sometimes. The operations take longer. The conversion rates are higher for more complicated cases. You basically you end up with an open operation because there literally are a lot of cases that you, you can have the greatest intention. I am going to do this minimally invasive with small holes laparoscopically, and in some surgeries, the conversion rate to open is 20, 30 percent. Oh, wow. So you end up with an open operation. Mm. Then there's hand assist surgery that some people do. So what they do is they make a decent size incision in the abdomen. This is mostly for colon surgery. Yeah. And they put their hand in there and they go in with laparoscopically with instruments and their hand helps dissect. That's supposed to be a bridge from open it's kind of like a to laparoscopic. It's a hybrid. Yeah. But you still have a decent size incision in the middle of the abdomen. What robotic surgery has done is it took all the shortcomings of laparoscopic surgery and basically eliminated them. So now you have wristed instruments. So you put your instruments in and they have more rotation than your wrist does. Oh. So now I can go around things. I can operate on the ceiling of the abdomen. So now when someone has ventral hernias, you can't close those laparoscopically because you can't suture right. on the upper part right. of the abdomen. I can close those defects That's and wild. then put a piece of mesh there. Recurrence rate is lower robotically than laparoscopic. Um, the conversion rate is significantly lower, so all those complications, as I said, with bowel obstructions and hernias, all go away. Um, length of stay on operations, because now they're done minimally invasive and not with right. a conversion rate to open. You're able to do more complex cases that you never would have approached laparoscopically. So the, the, a big case that we do is something that has a recurrent hernia. Yeah. So especially a recurrent laparoscopic hernia. So somebody did a laparoscopic hernia, now we have mesh on the inside. Mm -hmm. That's a guaranteed open operation because you cannot go back into that space laparoscopically. Robotically, you get back into that space, 
you fix the hernia and they still have a minimally invasive surgery. What an advantage for the patients. Yeah, it really is. You know? Is it hard to learn? Like, what was the learning process like? It, it, also, it depends on, um, basically it depends on, every surgeon's different. Yeah. Some, their learning curve can be 10, some can be 20, some can be 30. So when, when you I, say 10, 20, 30, that's cases. cases. Yeah. So I'm also a, uh, a proctor for robotic surgery. So I go around New England, I proctor surgeons at all these hospitals. And basically they want me to tell, the hospital wants me to tell them, is the surgeon safe? Right. So they don't want me to tell them he's outstanding, he's, uh, he's lightning fast. Um, they want to say, is he a, sur a safe surgeon? Of so course. that's my goal. So you start off safe. And then, like regular surgery, as you get more comfortable with your technique, you can go a little faster in the operating room. What are the usual lengths? Like, so we'll talk just about the robotic assisted surgery. So, what are the like normal, I guess, uh, time durations for surgeries, like for gallbladder versus? So, a straightforward gallbladder console time on the robot could be 15 to 20 minutes. That's crazy. A straightforward colon operation console time probably about an hour, hour fifteen minutes. What's mm. the biggest difference you saw with uh, like a type of surgery with a robotic assisted? Is it being able, like you said, to do like the abdominal sealing? You can get to any spot you need to. So when I go into an abdomen, a lot of people have had prior surgery. Yeah. So I only try to do what I'm there to do. So if I'm there to take out a gallbladder, I don't want to take down adhesions. So if I can get around the adhesions and do my surgery without disturbing the adhesions, right. that's what I want to do. So I, only, I tell people, if, so if there's anything between me and the surgery site, I need to take them down. But if I can find a way around them with the wristed instruments, and the other thing with the scope, is that we can port hop and we can put the scope in any of the ports oh, so cool. I can get different visualization angles on the uh, that's a big benefit on the uh, on the patient <clears throat> and unlike laparoscopic surgery where someone is holding the scope for you and it tends to drift because mm -hmm. they're holding it, I actually control the scope myself right that's so I'm great. controlling my two or three instruments and the scope and there's no tremor right because there it, is you know not. I mean, some people have a tremor. It's, it's just yeah. part, and you get tired and you have a little more, but the robot makes up for that. Right? Zero, zero tremor on the robot. And the other thing with the robot, like I said, is that when you're doing it laparoscopically, depth is a problem because 3D body, 2D screen. This, you can actually depth percept. So when you go to get something, you're right on top of it instead of passing by it or just trying to get to it. Make sure it's, you don't have that anymore. So basically, um, less risk of infection. You can get to places you can't get with a standard laparoscope. Um, gets rid of the whole tremor issue that um, some people can suffer with and the fatigue issue too, I would guess. A lot of advantages. Yeah. But one of the biggest advantages is this less open surgery. And less open surgery, yeah. Because it all comes down, if you can, because laparoscopic surgery is great. If everything can be done laparoscopically, then it's great, but the, there's limits to laparoscopic surgery, so we still do a lot of open surgery because of laparoscopic surgery. This gets rid of that. Are the bariatric surgeries done via robotic assist too now? Yes. So at St. Anne's Hospital, we have three bariatric, robotic bariatric surgeons. Oh, that's great. And it's, it offers the same advantages, um, especially for, depending on body habitus, to get to your spot. Yeah. It's it's all about, you can imagine if you are, if you're doing a laparoscopic case, let's say a long laparoscopic case, three hours, your arms are in the air for three constant hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Robotically, there's a pad right in front of you that you rest your elbows on, and then your fingers are controlling the robot. So your shoulders are where they belong, your head is straight, you're not looking up or down on a screen. Yeah. So you actually feel pretty good when you're done yeah, with surgery. Because I mean a lot of surgeons in occupational hazards, they get a lot of neck issues over time, you know, cervical degeneration and that. So you don't have to deal mm -hmm. with that issue because you're not hunched over all the time. That was the oh, so our injuries have changed over time as well. So open surgeons, cervical neck problems, because they're looking down. Of course. 
laparoscopic surgeons shoulder problems and rotator cuff problems because you're like this. <laughs> Both of those will be pretty much eliminated by robotic surgery. That's great. Now, what have the advances been in robotic surgery? Like, what's like next to come out with robotic surgery to make it more cutting edge? So now, what we're gonna have with robotic surgery coming out is we're gonna be able to overlay CT scans onto the patient in the screen. Wow. So for organs with tumors like kidneys, livers, you can actually see the tumor in the organ on the screen. <laughs> So you know exactly where you are uh, need to cut. Um, already the technology is great. When I am firing my stapler across the colon, the stapler tells me if it's too thick of a tissue or not. If you just fire uh -huh. your regular manual stapler, you'll just push it through and you don't know was it a good right. cut. Right. This one will say upgrade stapler. That's great. So the staple height mm -hmm. changes. And then when you go into, like do a, if you're doing a biliary surgery, there's ways, you were, I think you were telling me you can, it'll protect the bile ducts, because that's one of the complications that can occur. For... So in the, in the good old days, and still to this day, surgeons will do what's called a cholangiogram. So they put a little catheter into the duct of the gallbladder, right. and they get behind a, a, a door, and they inject dye, and you can see the common bile duct. Basically, part of that, you might be looking for stones in the common bile duct, but the other part is to see where the common bile duct is to avoid injury. But nothing, all the literature shows that cholangiograms do not uh, decrease the chance of a common bile duct injury. What the robot does is something called Firefly, and it does that right now. So there's a dye that we can inject that's very inexpensive. It's under $10, believe it or not. And that dye circulates and it gets into the biliary system. So when I'm doing my surgery, I can actively see the bile duct green. So it makes me, I'm able to operate faster in a difficult case knowing this is where my common bile duct is and you avoid injury. It lights up the cystic duct and the common bile duct so you know where to clip. Jeez. So in a lot of these tougher gallbladder cases, the you'll go cell by cell because you don't know where the common bile duct is. Mm. And in fact, an article that was recently published showed that this was difficult gallbladders, acute cholecystitis, and worse. And out of 600 robotic gallbladders, there was one conversion to open. Out of 400 laparoscopic gallbladders, 30% converted to open. Yeah. And that's a big recovery when you have to have a open gallbladder surgery. So then is there pressure put on, like from insurance companies for doctors, for surgeons to be um, certified, I guess, is that the right word in robotic surgery? It's not necessarily the insurance companies. The insurance companies want to just make sure you're doing a safe operation. And an open operation is safe, a laparoscopic operation is safe, and a robotic operation is safe. As long as you're doing the correct operation with a correct indication, that's what the insurance companies care about right now. Hospital, on the other hand, they look at it as if you can do a minimally invasive surgery, the patient can go home instead of being in the hospital for three, four days. Right. Mm -hmm. And then off, and the other thing with that opioid problem that we seem to be, that we are having, if I can give somebody five Percocet pills for a robotic surgery instead of 20, right. 25 for an open surgery, it's a big difference. Can yeah. we talk about so, that a little yeah. bit? So like sure. as a patient, like I'm gonna be nervous if I have to go in for surgery. Um, and I should tell all of you is I, I did have surgery with Dr. Herman Gildo and he was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> but um, so <laughs> if, if I'm a patient and I'm getting nervous about my abdominal surgery that's that's coming up, my benefits from listening to you talk about all this is I'm going to have a lot less pain. My recovery time is probably going to be less, and I'm just going to feel better overall. Back to work sooner, back to your normal life sooner. Uh, is that a benefit nowadays? Back to work sooner. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot of a lot of patients they still they think of the good old days. So you right. say you're going to do a surgery, and they go, "Well, I need to be out of work for six weeks." I go. Right. 
go back to work in three days. <laughs> right. They're like, really? yeah. <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> probably doesn't make you the most popular. Like, you know, just, just do it open. I don't, none of this robot stuff for me. <laughs> yeah. So, like, what are the limitations then? Because, you know, like, and it was, what, two weeks to drive and all that yeah. stuff. So is there any of those restrictions? After, after my, uh, any of these robotic operations, I tell patients, don't lift more than 40 pounds for two weeks. You can drive after a couple of days. And anyone that does hardcore exercise, probably four weeks from surgery. But sense. you could swim, you could walk, you can bicycle, you can go on a treadmill right after surgery. That's great. That's and then crazy. for the golfers out there that say, can I golf? I go, you can, but do not blame me for a bad game. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> if someone gets a slice after surgery, you know, they're it like... It was my surgery. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. I don't know. Maybe they'd want to golf after surgery. All the golfers are going to be planning surgeries with you so they can have an excuse now on their drives. So, so the robot's being used for basically anything in the abdomen. So yes. urologic procedures, general surgery procedures. GYN. Uh, GYN, oncological procedures. Pedobiliary. Are they using it for um, thoracic cases? Yes. In neurosurgery cases. They have a different robot. Okay. So we have, at St. Anne's, we have three robots, basically. We have the neurosurgery robot, we have an orthopedic robot, and then we have the da Vinci robot. The da Vinci is all for, for cavity cases, so for chest and abdomen and pelvis, the da Vinci. The other ones are for the other things. But St. Anne's has been recognized as the busiest robotic hospital of any of the Stewart hospitals in the country and I think what, it was like 30, 30 something now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. and we are pretty much one of the busiest robotic hospitals in uh, in New England you know, that goes to show, again, we live in a gray area if we get sick. Right. I mean, and, and it can be local. Like, you're not traveling up to Boston anymore. You know, yeah, everything Hardly ever do you have to send a patient to Boston these days. Yeah. I mean, there are some very specialized cases of that course. come up. Pancreatic cases, things like that. I mean, they, Liver. So basically, if somebody comes to see me in the office, um, I'll be on, honest with them. I'll go, this case needs to be done here. And those are liver operations pancreas operations, um, sarcoma cases. Right. Uh, they shouldn't come to us, but if they happen to get to us. Um, gastric cancer that's more proximal, like towards the esophagus, where somebody might have to cut into the esophagus, into the chest, we refer those to, uh, to the Boston hospitals. Because that's where you'll probably need maybe two teams, maybe yeah. need a thoracic team and a... Uh, and the, the surgical team to take care of that patient. Do they use the same robot? Yeah, they're the same robot. That's so great. we have this three models out there right now. The SI, which is the lowest model, they are not making them anymore, but some hospitals still have them. We do not have that one. The new one is the X, which we have one of, and then the XI, which we also have one of. And the XI is one of those robots that the bed is allowed to move while you're attached to the robot. Hmm. So God. I use that for my colon cases. So if I'm working the pelvis, I can have the feet up and the head down because now everything moves out of the way. Okay. Yeah. If I want to switch it to the upper part of the abdomen, I just have them put the patient in the opposite direction so everything goes down so I can work on the colon or on the liver or the spleen. That has to be handy with different body types too. You know, like it's handy with every body type. Yeah. So it, whether uh, whether you have uh, a BMI of twenty or you have a BMI of seventy, there's always something in the way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you go into the abdomen, the small bowel is just free everywhere. It's the colon that's fixed to the sides, but your small bowel is free, and that small bowel will literally. And then the omentum, which is a fat pad that hangs from our stomach down, that's covering everything. So for us to see the gallbladder, we put head up. So now everything comes away from the liver, so now you can see the gallbladder. If you want to see the uterus or the prostate, you put them in steep Trendelenburg, and now everything goes back. Now you can see your stuff. <laughs> and then if you want to see the right colon or the left colon, you flip them in the opposite direction because mm. everyone, their intestine will be everywhere. And we need to just push the, put the bed in the direction so we can actually see. That's the number one thing with surgery is you can do a surgery only if you can see what you're doing.
Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons to convert, I can't see. So if you're doing it laparoscopically and you can't get to or see what you want, mm -hmm. you need to open. And then in those cases when you do them robotically, if you can't get to or see what you need to do to do a safe operation, you need to open. That's pretty rare though, right? It happens, I'm sure, but how often does it occur percentage-wise? Oh. Oh, robotically, the conversion rate for hernias are in low single digits. Mm -hmm. The conversion rate for colons are in single digits, robotically. Um, gallbladders, they're in single digits, whereas mm -hmm. these are all in double digits for laparoscopic or higher. What's the trickiest surgery you do? None of the surgeries are tricky. It's just what you find that's tricky. And that, that's the thing. So if you go in there and you're surprised, or if it's worse than you thought it was, yeah. that's when it is. But any surgery that's routine, a routine gallbladder, a routine colon, um, they, they, you still got to do the, a safe, good surgery. You got to control the blood vessels. You got to get out what you're supposed to. Good technique to put things back together. Um, but if nothing is stuck to anything, then it's fine. People that have had prior surgery, people that have had mesh, sometimes getting to the abdomen, inside the abdomen, just to get there is difficult if you've had prior mesh operations. So we have ways to get around that. Uh, if you go in there, if they've had prior open surgery, they might have a lot of scar tissue in there. Intestine stuck to their belly wall. And the robot's great for that because you can take down those adhesions. You can get to where you want to on the abdominal wall. Just take those adhesions down, and now you can continue with your surgery. What age group do you operate on? Uh, right now at St. Anne's, now it's 16 to, there's no age limit. We've done cases on 98, 100-year-old people. Mm. We used to do pediatric, I used to do pediatric appendectomies. Yeah. But we now are having difficulty, and we ship those appies to, uh, to, to Providence. Providence. So we don't have the backup from the pediatricians in the hospital. So if we don't have backup from the pediatricians, we can't admit a patient overnight. And the appendix is, I used to do three, four-year-old appies. Right. And if you don't have pedi, not that you needed them, but right. you want them to be course, involved for safety. For safety. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And if they're not available, then it's better for the patient just to go to uh, Providence. What yeah. about like emergency surgery? Suppose someone gets in like a, a really bad car wreck or something like that and you have to get in. Can you use, is that a situation where you would still use the robotic assistant? Luckily for us, trauma does not come to St. Anne's Hospital. <laughs> when I started back in the early 2000s, we actually got trauma. Uh -huh. we, we weren't a designated trauma center, but if somebody had trauma right in the fall area, they could end up, and we had gunshots and right. stabs. But, you know, we go to a community hospital to not have that kind of intensity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, If you want course. that, you want to you go work at a city hospital, like in Boston <laughs> or Providence. So we like our elective cases. We do get emergencies, so people will come in septic, people will come in perforated, perforated colons in the middle of the night. Uh, gangrenous gallbladder, stuff like that. But it's not trauma cases. Mm. And in those cases, we can use the robot. In, yeah, in the in trauma cases? or in, No, no, no. In, in, uh, okay, in those urgent no, cases. In the, right. in the semi-urgent cases. Right. Hmm. Does it take a lot of time to get the robot prepared and all? Because I was thinking if that were the case, like, I know you, you're not doing trauma cases per se at the hospital, but it would seem that might be an issue. If it takes a long time to the, get set up. The reason that they would never really use the robot for trauma is that usually there's a bleeding problem going on. And you've got to get in there quick. And you have to get in there quick and you get a control of stuff. So basically when we do when we did trauma cases, is you make an incision, open up, and your hand is grabbing something that's bleeding. Right. And just trying to get control of the bleeding. And you couldn't really do that with the robot because right. you couldn't see. Right. Because you go in there and everything's red. So for them, it's still the good old incision in the hand yeah. is what works for trauma <laughs> cases. Yeah, that's going to be such a challenge as a surgeon when you open something up and all you see is, is blood in the field. So like I said, that the nice thing about general surgery, you have surprises and you can be creative. 
that is a couple of notches above what intensity does. When you go into a trauma case, you have no idea what you're going to find. What did that, let's say that bullet go through? Right. What did that knife go through? You have no idea the path. Did it go like this? Did it go like that? Sure. Where did it go or ricochet off of? Mm. And then, of course, with uh, motor vehicle accidents, and you have all this blunt trauma, which tends not to be operative. The blunt trauma from uh, motor vehicle accidents tends to be uh, the belly's non operative, but extremities, obviously, would be more orthopedic. Um, but all surprises. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's going to be stressful. It is very, very stressful. Mm. So the it was fun when you're in residency, right? Right. <laughs> trauma was fun in residency. Yeah. Trauma is not fun. Well, a in lot of things, life. you know. I mean, in residency, when we were in the ICUs, yeah. the surgical ICU, the medical ICU, working yeah. in the ER, it was fun because it was it was new, it was exciting. You had all this energy, but at a certain point, it's very stressful to deal with that stuff. No doubt, we all want a little control in our yeah. lives at some point. So. Well, especially surgery. We yeah. want total control of the operating room. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and we want things. But the robot, as far as the I turnover between cases, like 30 minutes. So it's not bad at all. No. And the robot's already set up. And putting in the ports is just like putting in the laparoscopic ports. And uh, then attaching the robot probably takes about three minutes. Mm. And then we can start our case. That's how great. do you like sterilize the robot between cases? It's draped. So that's you just. So the robot is cleaned like anything else. It's yeah, cleaned yeah. with like wipes, but all the arms are draped back to the base of the robot. So your turnover. I mean, it, it's yes. pretty quick. It can be. And the drapes in. click in. Every everything's sealed. It's just like any other case. Nice. Uh, when they use all these other robots, everything is just draped over. You know, it's amazing. I remember, you know, years ago watching like sci-fi shows and they'd have someone who was um, <laughs> ill and they put him in this tube and the, it was a robot and they would go in and make little ports and do the surgery. And that stuff didn't exist at the time. And it's all come to fruition. It's pretty remarkable. Oh, yeah. I used of to course, watch. In those situations, it's the robot doing it, but yeah. it's not. There's not I mean, an operator. We've got a long but... way to go for that, but I remember watching like... Um, Star Trek, right, and right. Uh, and in one case I'm the Bones, the doctor, right, right. Somebody was getting dialysis, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. and he, he's like, these animals, dialysis, and he goes, take this pill, you'll be fine, yeah. and the pill cured her <laughs> renal failure. Cured the kidney failure, right? We do a podcast wow. on that next well, week. Well, when well, Chekhov, I think, when he fell, he had a little yeah. bleed of a vein, yeah, yeah. And instead of going to the OR to drill a hole and evacuate, yeah. he put this little machine yeah. on the vein. <laughs> Sealed his blood vessel. See? It was a miracle. Yeah, it's visionary. Right, right. No, visionary. A little far from that. Far, but, but some <laughs> of the it, we're getting is, on. We're on the but, track. I mean, when we first saw these, you know, these the somewhat robotic um, operators, you know, it was like, wow, that will never happen. And we're kind of moving in that direction. We're definitely so. moving in that direction. It's pretty uh, wild. It's it's really amazing how things have advanced, and it hasn't been that long, really. When you first came to town, there was no robotic surgery, right? No, it didn't exist. No, you must it have existed, been one of the first it surgeons. Very. Yeah, I was. Uh, I started early on. As far as general surgery, obviously people were doing the robot from the late 90s, mm -hmm. other specialties. But they re general surgery was almost the last group that they yeah. were targeting. I think it started with urology, right? Yeah. yeah. So they were targeting general surgery almost last. So when we got on, when I got on in 2012, I was, in fact, I was so early that when I got proctored and when I went to look at cases... We were watching some like GYN doctors mm -hmm. doing cases. But there weren't general surgeons doing it. Right. Wow. So I just have a curiosity question, I guess. Um, of course, malpractice insurance is a big expense. Mm -hmm. Now, does it lessen when you do more surgeries, robotic assisted? No. Does it have any? It, it's, all, it's all the same. It's all the same. Uh, they have their rates, their base rates for all specialties. And, and that's it. It is what it is. The only time your rate changes is if you have, obviously, so. lawsuits. Then they may bump up your rates a little bit. But obviously, like, OB yeah. is one of the highest. Yeah. And um, neurosurgery. ER docs. And brother. internal medicine can be one of the lowest, yeah. Yeah. relatively speaking. Yeah, of course. But it doesn't change. Um, if you're an open surgeon, your rate's the same. If you're a robotic surgeon, your rate's the same. If you're a laparoscopic surgeon, your rate's the same. Hmm. doesn't matter. 
That's interesting. Yeah. How much say do you have, just going back to you as a general surgeon, so we had talked about the trauma centers. How much say do you have, like, if, say, St. Anne's wanted to become a trauma center, and then do you, like, how does that change what you're doing? The trauma is a basically a department. Okay. So for you to have trauma, and that's why it, we don't have it, you need buy-in from everybody. Yeah. You need ortho to buy into trauma. You need neurosurgery. You need everybody that be involved in trauma needs to form a team. You can't you can't have like one general surgeon right. said, I'll do it. Right. And there's right. like nobody else. Right. right. Because when that car accident comes and they have broken bones, what are you gonna do with that? Yeah. Or they have a brain bleed. So in community hospitals, you'd actually have to bring surgeons in specifically to say, you will come and be our trauma team mm. instead of converting the ones that are already there. Hmm. And, and that's the difference. Mm. And it's hard because look how close we are to uh, even Providence. Right. right. So, I mean, they have a full-time 24-7 trauma, like 15 miles down the road right right with people have been doing I mean, it for if a someone, long time if someone gets shot and 911 comes i mean they're being put in the ambulance and they're being brought right to rhode island hospital right. they're not even yeah. stopping see they're but, not stopping yeah so what happens though if if someone is really unstable and they don't think they'll make it to rhode island hospital do they stop off at a local hospital to try to get them patched up and, and they stabilized have. they have yeah and we get caught in that every once in a while so uh it hasn't happened in a long time, but it technically could happen. So if somebody is, uh, if somebody gets like shot, stabbed across the street from St. Anne's Hospital, it's a good chance they may end up at St. Anne's Hospital, right? Depending on their condition. Yeah. And then at least they can get lines in. They can get uh, blood Some going. Blood uh, they can even do a, um, they can even do a thoracotomy in the emergency room mm -hmm. and try to get control of uh, of bleeding. Yeah. So they have done that. And I remember being involved in one of those cases probably about 15 years ago. So they have done that. Yeah. I remember a wild case when I was uh, a resident. I was doing some moonlighting and we were at a hospital that's not even open anymore. And at the time, it was really in the process of closing. And at night, there were two doctors. There was the ER guy, and it was not a really busy ER. And there was the night float which was a resident who was working, making some moonlighting money, basically. Mm. And, you know, nothing was, there was a very quiet hospital. It was very quiet. It was getting ready to close its doors. And then we, one night I was there and we get this, um, I get this stat call to come to the emergency room. And it was unbelievable. There was this poor guy, he had had an industrial router accident. And this bit came off the router and went in his chest. So in the ER, the ER guy basically cracked his chest to try to deal with the situation and do some cardiac massage and find you know where the bit was and try to control um, the bleeding and it called Life Flight from UMass and needless to say it, it didn't work out. It was, you know by the time the patient got there, it was he was beyond saving. But um, he it was the closest hospital and they brought him in there. And, it, so that stuff does happen, yeah. um, which is really scary to the people who are involved. Very scary. But. It's, a, it's their best chance. I mean, the people there are, they might be rusty, but they're definitely qualified yeah. to be able to do that. And if it's a 100% chance of certainty of death, right. anything's better than 100%. Right. And this was death. one of those situations where it was you know, 100% certainty of death versus maybe a slim chance yeah. of survival if you went to the local hospital. But when you have projectiles, whether it be the router uh, or a bullet, when it gets in that chest cavity, did it hit the heart? Right. Now, is there a hole in the heart? Is there a right. hole in the aorta? Sure. I mean, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. So you must cringe sometimes when you're watching TV or watching a movie and they do like all these MacGyver stuffs with like surgery and save the person's life. They're up in a plane, you know, it's like, do you look at that stuff and go, oh, well, my what God, I, what I find fascinating <laughs> and um, is that. On some of these TV shows, some will have the most unbelievable major surgery they could ever have. Mm -hmm. And then they're on the floor right after surgery <laughs> extubated. Yeah. Talking. I'm like. They just had like a liver resection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And they're like on the floor in a regular room. Yeah. 
Yeah, no. exactly. No it makes side the story go up. better on no TV, nothing. but I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they were awesome. <laughs> yeah. Got me intubated for like a week. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I find they're that a liver transplant. They're up walking around the next day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, but that's but that's you know you got to they got to recover because only our show, right? Yeah, right. they got to be yeah. recovered <laughs> and back in the show by the end. <laughs> back by, to by the, the Star the Trek. Show, they're back home. And <laughs> Back That's at work. Crazy. When when patients see you in the office, like what's the list of questions that they should be asking and kind of thinking about, like when they're going in for surgery? Number one is is there an indication for the surgery? Mm-hmm. Uh, they Hopefully, can, the primary has figured that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, like for example, like the biggest one for that is um, most people gallstones, for example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The eighty percent of people with gallstones never have a symptom from their gallbladder, huh. and every year one to two percent of those get symptoms. Huh. So I'll get people in my office, obviously that have gallbladder disease and they're having symptoms, no brainer. But then they'll have somebody will come in and they go, "I had an ultrasound for my kidney and they found gallstones, and my primary care doctor just sent me here." I go, mm. Are you "Having any <laughs> problems?" They go, "Nope, I'm just here." I go. Okay, this is where your gallbladder is, right under the right rib cage. If when you're eating, if you have pain there, you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just I talking don't about do surgery needlessly. Yeah. Just... So basically, uh, so that's like the perfect example where, or we'll get sent a patient that they'll have, say, a lesion somewhere, and then they are asking your opinion if this needs to come out or it can be watched. So there's a lot of people that come to our office that leave without an operation because there was no indication for a surgery. They could just have be watched. Mm-hmm. What what takes patients by surprise, like after surgery, like when they do do they ever do they ever tell you, oh, it's like I this was better than what I thought, or like well with the robot that happens all the time. Yeah, especially for bigger surgeries. If you go in there and you say, I'm going to take out this much of your colon. Uh, and you say you're going to have a two-inch incision where I actually took the colon out, and then they see it afterwards, and they can't really tell they've had an operation. Yeah. And they, I didn't actually took it. I didn't take any Percocet. I took a couple of Motrin because it didn't really hurt. Oh, it geez. was sore. Mm. That's They're fantastic. surprised by that because they obviously had the stories from their parents. Right. Oh, yeah, I took. Eight weeks off after my surgery, I was in bed for like a week and a half. Well, gallbladder surgery was like that when they did open procedures. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a big thing, big incision. You here, can't. Right? So when you do the gallbladder surgery open, you literally transect the muscle of your abdomen. So now that muscle, that the muscle that you do sit-ups with, the muscle that you get out of bed with, the muscle you do everything with is now cut in half mm-hmm. when you do an open gallbladder. Mm-hmm. And that's what they used to do up until the 90s. Right. Yeah. yeah. Everybody. I mean, some depending on uh, what how uh, the patient's size, it, it was still a four-inch incision minimum. Right. And then it could be as big as you need it to be. Mm. The, the surgeons of the good old days were called maximum exposure surgeons. <laughs> they didn't think about after. They said, oh, I need to do, view. I need to see, I need to do a safe surgery, so what do I need? Yeah. Now with the exact opposite, we're right. like, how small of an incision can we make? Because mm-hmm. I'm thinking both ways. I'm like, I need to do my surgery, but my patient needs to recover. Yeah. Well, those big incisions, I mean, the risk of pneumonia, or other issues, it must be in wound infection. It's higher. So. Yeah, so you do an upper abdominal surgery, whether it be a gallbladder or an upper midline incision, patient's going to have trouble breathing. And they get pneumonia. They get pneumonia. Patient may, if it's an open surgery, they don't want to move, then they get blood clots in their legs. Right. Um... And that's, those are just other things not even related to bowel obstructions and hernias and infections. Those are just other things. Smaller surgery, patient will move after. Mm-hmm. But these bigger sur- And remember, we are able to do big surgeries with the robot. It's not, the okay. surgeries aren't any different. So the, I've taken out the whole colon through three little incisions, whereas that would require a a top to bottom incision. Yeah. So the operation has not changed. The inside, the same operation's done. It's just when the patient sees the outside, it's very different. Sometimes I'm amazed, you know, patients will have nephrectomies done, they'll have their kidneys out, and the incision is actually fairly small. 
Yeah. And I'm always amazed if they can get that out <clears> through <throat> that little hole. The, ki- the kidney is, unfortunately, is a solid organ. So the gallbladder is squishy. Yep. I can take it out through a small hole. The colon is squishy. I can take yep. it out through a small hole. Even the spleen. I can take out the spleen robotically, put it in a bag, and then put it into little pieces and take it out through a very yeah. small hole. And they can go home the next day. Yeah. Oh, my God. The kidney yeah. is usually for a tumor. Right. You cannot cut the, t- the kidney when you're looking at a tumor. Mm-hmm. So depending on how big the kidney is, that's your incision. Right. right. So if it's the whole kidney, you have a bigger incision. Mm-hmm. If it was a partial nephrectomy, you have a smaller incision. Right. And that's basically the kidney because you cannot morselate the kidney. You cannot morselate an organ that has a cancer in it. Let's just say that. Right, right. You don't want to be... Because the pathologist needs to know how big was it. Did it invade nerves? Did it invade vessels? And if it's all in little pieces, they can't tell you. And then obviously you need to know for uh, post-op treatment, such as radiation and chemotherapy, how big this tumor really is. You know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a super nice wife. And um, <laughs> John, are you, are you listening? Uh, of course, he is. Call in, please. So, <laughs> so it was New Year's Day. My husband, we had a house full of people, and um, my husband was upstairs lying in bed because he didn't feel good. And I was like, Can you please get up and help me and come down and work with our guests? And he's like, I'm really not feeling that great. And I'm like, John, take a Tums. You know, so anyways, later that night, he's in, in the OR, um, and the surgeon comes out and he says, His gallbladder was black. Um, It was totally black. (laughs) And and I'm like, you know, whoops. (laughs) We've we've had those. Well, my wife, I'm sure, would be the same way. She's an RN. (laughs) And if I complain of anything, she goes, is there really anything wrong with you? (laughs) Right. Exactly. It's nothing. Yeah, it could be a baby. (laughs) And then your appendix is, like, perforated. Yeah. (laughs) So, like, in those instances, like, when you get in there and see stuff like that, it, you know, is it better if you have, like, the, the robot with you? Because it has to be, like, a, a little bit of a more It It is an advantage surgery. because now, one, you know, again, your surgery becomes different. Yeah. So if I, a, a couple cases, if you have a really, really bad appendix, sometimes you have to free up and mobilize the colon and do a partial colon resection to take out your appendix. Huh. Much easier with the robot than mm. laparoscopic. Of course. And now you've got a infected appendix. So if you do an open cut, you're going to have a post-op infection. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I had a case where I had a lady that had a left inguinal hernia and a bowel obstruction. So the loop of bowel went in there. The loop of bowel was black in her hernia. Uh. So in the good old days, you'd make a cut here. Uh, you do a bowel resection, you have an infection, you maybe put a temporary mesh in, uh, you try to close it without mesh. Yes. If you put a piece of mesh in there, risk of infection. Mm. I was able to I go in robotically through upper belly incisions. I pull that loop of bowel out of the hernia without perforating it. It's literally as black as your jacket, as your sweater. And then I fix the hernia robotically with a piece of mesh, no spillage. And then I make a little incision in the upper abdomen, probably about two inches. I bring out the bowel. I do my bowel resection, put them back together, drop it in. No contamination. She left within a couple of days out of the hospital. Wow. No chance of infection of the groin. Uh, An an older lady, probably in her 80s. Oh, my gosh. So she would have not done well with a big laparotomy. Right. Uh, She already had, or big incision or groin, would have had trouble walking. I guess another big benefit, too, is like time under anesthesia, right? Yeah. So the thing that I find with robotic surgery is that it makes you more confident in your operation, in your dissection, that you can get. You're not struggling to do your operation. You're just doing your operation. Right. And that struggling, that trying to get to where you go, Position. can take a lot of time in the operating room. Mm. That going down the gallbladder to get to the common bile duct and assistant duct, takes more time if you're unsure is it bowed towards the gallbladder i gotta go really really slow in case i so i don't want to injure it but if i know where it is now i can move a little quicker and i know this tissue can just be burned and i can just get to my uh my cystic duct that's great yeah so you can so the cases go really 
go faster because you don't waste time struggling like you do in laparoscopic surgery. Are mm -hmm. they teaching um, the robotic procedures as part of the curriculum now? Every program. Mm. So what they do in the programs is they'll have dual console robots. Oh. So I have a single console, so one surgeon sits at it. But you'll have dual console robots, so both robots, one or the other, can control the operation. So what they do is that the attending will be in one robot, the resident will be in the other robot, and the attendant will be like, okay, do this part of the operation. He'll do it. And then if he needs to take over, he takes over. That's neat. It's kind of like when and you're driving, uh, going to drive, head. right? Yeah. <laughs> like when, when, we were, when we did it laparoscopically or, or uh, open, it was right there. So the surgeon would just take the stuff out of your hands and start doing it. Mm. Whereas now he just pushes a button now he controls it and you you're locked out that's you can't I mean, that's control canceled. anything <laughs> so now the uh, the medical students don't have to sit there for four hours holding retractors anymore either huh so now <laughs> when i'm in the when i'm in the or all the staff is sitting on a stool yeah because all they need to do is because i'm controlling everything yeah. right. they just need to take the instrument out slide the instrument in I remember, and they're sitting on a stool. I remember That's holding fantastic. retractors for like these long operations, and your arm would be literally falling off, yeah. and it was painful. Oh. And and in residency, you'd you'd be falling asleep holding a retractor, but you were so good, you'd be full asleep still holding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you wouldn't even fall over. I'd be like right there. You take a little cat. Yeah, right? I'm just shutting one eye. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell those operations went on for a long time. So there's no retracting anymore because it's robotic. You got the whole view, That's right? Great. You got the whole view. I just view. like I I have a zero pain tolerance. Uh, I'm just painting such a good picture of myself, <laughs> aren't? But I have like a zero pain tolerance. So I would much like I'm just thinking like without all that manipulation and everything else, like mm. my pain level is so much lower after surgery, you know. But even even like even the difference between laparoscopic hernias and um, and robotic hernias. When we go in robotically, if it's a left angle hernia, I just go to the left side. I just pull that hernia down, I slide a little mesh in, close it up, done, in about 30 minutes. When you go in laparoscopically, you go, you make your little holes, you bring down the whole peritoneum. So you're between the muscle layer and the peritoneum, so you're outside the abdomen. But you do both sides, because the balloon is like a, is shaped like, well, like a rectangle almost. So even though you're not operating on both sides, you bring both sides down which increases your chance for bleeding from muscle right. on both sides. And when you're doing the hernia, especially in big hernias, if you make a little hole in that peritoneum, now all the CO2 that's in that space escapes into the abdomen. Now you can't see. Now you convert. Oh, jeez. So you, when you have, let's say, big scrotal hernias, in, impossible to do laparoscopically. You get into, that, uh, into the hernia sac, which leads to the abdominal cavity and visualization gone. Robotically, you're in the abdomen and you can pull as much intestine out of that uh, hernia as you need to and then fix the hole. Wow. That's perfect. That's remarkable. And it that's really what I'm saying. That's another, that's another conversion that scrotal hernias would tend to be done open right off the bat because they know that they really can't be right. done laparoscopically. Right. But now... Robotic. So if you were going to leave one message with our viewers, because I think, unfortunately, I mean, we could talk for hours on this, I know, but it's I all, know. we're already getting to the end of the show. Uh, it's, it's amazing how quickly it went. What would be the one thing or a couple of points that you'd like to get out there? So um, my summary is basically that robotic surgery is the best chance for you to come out with a minimally invasive surgery compared to laparoscopic surgery. And when you can get a minimally invasive surgery, it will have a shorter length of stay. It'll have decreased complication rate, decreased infection rate, um, faster operating times. It's just, there is no negative to the robot where there are negatives to laparoscopic surgery. So mm -hmm. basically it comes down to, can we do minimally invasive surgery do it more efficiently. Don't touch things to uh, cause ileuses. Don't cause small bowel obstructions later on. Don't cause pain with bigger incisions. So it's just a, everything about it is just 
so much better for the patient. So it's important for a patient to know what their surgeon does, whether they yes. do robotic surgery or not. Not all surgeons do it, no. and not all are have have the experience needed to do it. No. So you definitely, if you want, we right here in Fall River are doing cutting edge surgery, especially robotics for most things in the abdomen and even urology. That there's almost no reason to go to Boston or Providence. And in fact, if you do end up going to Boston Providence for regular cases, instead of being operated on by an experienced surgeon, oh, you're going to be operated right. on by the resident and not the experienced yeah. surgeon. I don't think patients realize that. I, I mention no, no, no. that very often. I mean, yeah. clearly there are some things you have to go yeah. <clears throat> to Boston for. But on those bigger <clears throat> cases, but, it's the attending is taking a bigger right. role. They're taking a bigger so if role. they're doing right. a liver resection or something like that, the, the attending surgeon is doing a lot of the yeah, case, so. but if it's just a, if it's a gallbladder or a hernia, the resident is pretty much doing the whole case. So they, they go, yeah. I'm in Mass General, but the surgeon that was in Fall River would have done better than the right. resident right. at Mass right. General. It's a good point right. to know. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. This has been sure. really great. It's been really educational. I also want to thank our, our sponsor, Bay Coast Bank. Thank you very much. Baycoast Bank is right for all of your financial needs. Visit baycoastbank.com or call 508-678-7641 to learn more. Dr. Miguel, thank you very much. This was great. We really, really learned a lot today. Thank you, Chris. Thank and, you, Nancy. Oh, if, if someone wants to contact you. Oh, uh, we're in the Primacare Complex, Steward Surgical um, Specialists, 508-567-0463. Is the office phone number Great. obviously online as well? Um, or just ask your primary. Or just ask your primary kid. <laughs> yeah. all right. And Taylor will post all that yeah, contact we'll post all that. information on our all right, uh, website. Well, Before we sign off, oh, though, yes, okay. I um, just wanted to say we're looking for uh, artist um, submissions to do a cover photo for our podcast. So anyone out there with any kind of drawing talent, send us your submissions um, for our cover picture for yeah. our podcast. We want to put this on our website and make yeah. it a cover picture. And yeah, and make, you can sign it we'll so you get the recognition. A, you know, maybe yeah. a bit of a contest and yeah. some recognition. And um, you have to be really good about making me look better than I currently look. <laughs> or you don't have so to worry about a, that. It can be, be caricatures. I just, you know, I want to look about 10 years younger, please. So, you know, <laughs> use like the geriatric references. But you can do something really cool. It doesn't have to be caricatures. It can no, be whatever, what, you want. whatever you want. But um, we'd be interested to get your submissions on that. That'd Thanks awesome. so much. And we'll have that on the, I think, on our yeah, we'll Facebook page yep. and how to do that. Great. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day, and we'll see you back in two weeks.